Fires raged across the abbey. Its walls were battered and barely standing now. Centuries in the construction, the toil of great swathes of the people of this island, yet it had taken only days to reduce, to smash, to render almost ineffectual. The enemies now approaching the very gates were not some ragtag band of cultists, were not Xenos or witches. They were the very scourge of the Imperium, once sons thereof. They were Chaos Space Marines, and none seemed able to slow their onslaught. The missiles of the Exorcist tanks had been unremitting in their barrages. The castigators had been all but destroyed. Immolators had been readied and were positioned all along the segments where there were gaping wounds in the outer walls. This would be where they would concentrate their efforts, where they would make their breaches. Paragon warsuits, Celestian sacrosancts, and penitent engines were prepared for a counter-strike in any area where the heathens broke through. The walls were lined with squads of battle sisters, with smatterings of retributors amongst them. The botters they fired down in ordered volleys, the heavy weapons of the defences gone, blown apart by nightfall of the preceding day, but the retributors replaced their wrath as best they could. But it was all for nothing, if the main thrust of the enemy were not stalled at the very least. Time. The sisters needed to buy time. For if they could just hold on, just make it through the next few days, the chapter of Loyalist Space Marines was already heading in their direction. It would take a few more days before they were in striking distance, able to lend their strength. For few could stand against the Astartes, so who better to counter the power-armored warriors of chaos than the Emperor's own angels of death? But it would still take days. The Mandeville point was far out in the system. And were not the Sisters of Battle also power-armored? Yet they were not as accurate, not as robust, not as skilled, not as enhanced. Yet the Sisterhood was the only formation able to give even a modicum of resistance. So it was here that the Chaos scum threw the first part of their strength. It was the battle that would define the entire war, and it was being lost. Rents appeared in the gatehouse to the main thoroughfare into the structure. Concentrated attacks of LAS cannons, Reaper launcher missiles, and heavy bolters slammed not into the gates themselves, but the two surrounding structures. As they crumbled, the eighty-foot doors fell backwards into the main courtyard, crushing hundreds of defenders set there. Tanks and positions were flattened, and the enemy had a perfect ramp into the very midst of the sisters' defenses. Pandemonium reigned in the citadel, but was quickly controlled. The cannoneers moving forward and taking personal command of the forces, bringing order and discipline again. The sisters stood their ground, but what came through the doors was beyond anything they had witnessed, beyond anything they had even read of in the most terrible parables of the unclean. Neverborn possessed and twisted metal hulks with tentacles and claws that ripped entire squads apart. Things that came down like ancient lizards, breathing fire and snatching victims off into the skies. And of course, the relentless onward march of the traitor Astartes. Their armor and robust frames deflecting the majority of fire, despite it being from holy bolters. Theirs were larger. Theirs had longer range, more penetration, and more explosive power. It could take half a squad concentrating on one marine to take him down whereas their fire tore through the sisters like their armor was barely there. Yet it was many times the defensive power of the armor of the guard, so whether they acknowledged it or not, the sisters were in a better position than their allies across the world. Yet it was here that the axis of the battle turned, this very moment, the crux point of the conflict. The Chaos Marines were now pushing into the small city-like construct and past the lines of defenders in this one most important of all regions. They were unstoppable, but were they united? The cannoness witnessed the butchery firsthand, calculating all vectors, 
all possibilities, as swiftly as she could. The training she had received at the School of Progenium all those years ago, still the bedrock of her existence. As astute as any commissar or general, the canoness knew she had few options, little chance of victory. So she threw all of her might into the one last throw of the dice, for she gambled mightily this day. If the main van of the force was led by a subordinate, they were dead, all of them. But if it were not, if it was the actual Chaos Lord who was in the midst of this push, then they had a chance. If the head of the Hydra could be struck down, struck off, then the rest would fall upon one another. For it was almost universally known that evil consumes itself. It always had, and always would. So all rested on this one head, this one target. The canoness turned to the leaders of her most elite forces, the Sacrosants, the Celestians. Both stood ready. But it was on the Repentia Superior she finally settled her gaze. She simply nodded, and the Repentia Superior then bowed and turned on her heel and strode out with purpose. She knew exactly what she needed to do. The van of the assaulting army surged forward, defilers and chaos engines now splitting off and heading down every road, controlling every junction. But the main force was now comprised mostly of the unstoppable marines. They were shooting and gutting sisters in their droves as they progressed, for nothing seemed able to stop them. It was then that there was a parting of the defending forces, making way for a counter-offensive the likes the traitors had never seen. Many stood agog for a moment, before giggling as they pulled their triggers and watched unarmored women explode. For a huge gathering of near-naked women now charged their lines. It was utterly nonsensical. While the sisters had heavy warframes, power armor, or even tanks, they had chosen to throw what looked like their own equivalent of mad and untrained and unarmored hordes at the main push. It seemed utterly insane. Until they hit. Many of them were culled as they came in, but these were sisters of battle, the Adeptus Sororitas. The lack of armor had meant their natural agility was not constrained, and as the power armor was no counter to the bolters of the marines, it actually did them more favors than being fully armored would have. So more of them hit than was expected. And when they did, it did not go as the Chaos Marines would have thought. For each was armed with a huge two-handed chainsword with a crackling energy field around it. These were eviscerators. Not the same potence as the marine version, to be sure, but they were effective enough all right and they were more than capable of tearing through the power armor of the traitors, something they had not expected. Not one bit. The horde of screaming and slashing women were torn apart by bolters, executed with bolt pistols, crushed with power mauls and sliced to ribbons by power swords and weapons of the marines. But for every two that went down, a marine toppled to their side for they were utterly without concern for their own lives. The proof of their ardor was their death, their sacrifice, one that they seemed rabidly enthusiastic to gain. And this level of commitment, of fanaticism, was a thing of terror to the worshippers of the Dark Gods. For by bending the knee to evil, they had become selfish, become egotistical, become fallible. And when the Marines started to fall, their line shuddered. The Chaos Lord was close and witnessed the cracking of his lines, saw the needle turn against him in this moment, and he took action. Striding forth with his entourage, the Chaos Lord drove into the very heart of the sea of chainsword-wielding women. He hacked and slashed and shot his way forward, leaving carpets of dead in his wake. He had to act quickly, he knew, for his scopes and augers showed his breeches being stalled all across the lines. His armies were on the very verge of failure, while being on the very footstep of victory. He looked for a voice ahead, a leader. And there she was. The one female ape, who had been barking orders, was lashing around her with a whip, but striking her own to motivate them, instead of engaging with any of the myriad marines in her vicinity. 
it was her. It had to be. Thus the Chaos Lord crouched, and then launched himself into the air on his power armour and augmented limbs. He leapt over those between them, and landed hard and rolled to come up but twenty paces from this whip-wielding woman. She marked his arrival with a lowering of her head, as she then broke into a slim but wide grin. Always keeping eye contact, she then lashed her whip and created a loud crack different to those before. Having gained the attention of a dozen of the fanatical women around her, the Repentia Superior bunched her whip and merely pointed at the Chaos Lord. He had but seconds to reposition, as he was set upon by a dozen of these maddened berserkers, each one coming at him in turn, like some mad demonstration or a test of his skills. He began to chortle when he had slain four of them with contemptuous ease. The next half-dozen came faster and faster, but each came out of the engagement without their limbs, none with their lives intact. But the event had been coordinated. They had planned this. For the last three to assail him came on so fast behind their predecessors that he could not quite make every block, every counter. And he realized with horror that each of the lives he had taken, each of the ladies he had gutted, had sacrificed their lives to put him out of stance, to nudge him into opening his guard to the few strikes that would count. And as the first blade bit into his leg, he could feel the energy crackling from it, breaking down the conveyor and bonds on his ceramite armor, permitting the teeth of the eviscerator to dig into his leg armor and then be pulled into it and then to churn and tear his flesh from his bones. The next strike was at his shoulders, passing his guard in the milliseconds of dead time that the chainsword in his leg had created. It again bit into his shoulder just before the pauldron, a million to one strike that was only made possible by the lies given to create these openings and his right arm went dead, as the blood and viscera fountained out of him, the central segment of his warplate providing some resistance, but not enough. Bleeding from his shoulder and torso, his leg barely connected anymore, the Chaos Lord went to his one remaining knee, but it was too late. As the traitor marines around him looked on, unable to intervene due to the screeching harpies unleashed on them by the Sisterhood, the Chaos Lord looked up into the eyes of the Repentia Superior as the last of the maddened Haridans flipped and brought her two-handed chainsword down into the very middle of his skull. The Lord was sane immediately, but the vision of the sister stood there, holding her blade tight and digging it, first through his skull and then standing there with an insane concentration as she slowly pushed the blade through the entirety of the Marine, cutting him clean in two. The Chaos Marines who saw this started to step back. The depleting Repentia now being supported by a huge thrust of warsuits Sacrosans and Zephyrim. And then they turned tail and ran. The world was a single light in the dark sea of the void. It had not fared well in the moments of darkness, and a rot had set in. All alone in the night, it quietly rebelled. And all ships that attempted landing were never seen again. Yet it was in the path of a fleet of a holy war of the Adeptus Sororitas. I do not heed the blessings anymore. More to put it, they do not trouble me as they once did. Once we were faithful to another, to the one God. But he abandoned us. In a time of need, he withdrew his light and left us stranded in the dark, where there were things, the tales of yesteryear, the legends from the cradle, but they were real, and they were here, and we were abandoned. They ate the clergy first, you see, 
laughter and crunching echoing in the night. Screams often slid across our world as they gorged on us. They took one starter of our society after another. You would awake to find another inch off the top, another cull, another directed very specific slaughter. We lived in fear. Dread is what the elders say. So when another light came, a new hope, we grabbed it with both hands. We turned our backs on the false god, and we worshipped the many. Was a tithe so different to our new bass blessings? It was worse, harsher, more costly. We would have entire generations worth of toil ripped from our hands and taken into the stars. They came rarely, but they would always expect the coffers to be full, the silos to be overbrimming. And they were harsh if this was not the case. Once, in our long ago, a generation was skipped. They did not come. So our people thought they would never come again. We believed we were finally free. And we ate well. We built. We harvested and invested in ourselves, our culture, our world. Yet when they returned, there were no coffers. There were no stocks over brimming. And instead... Instead, they took half of our population. Half. Slaves, warriors, cattle, meat. We never knew their fate. But we learned then. They would never let go. We were theirs. No matter how long between visits. No matter how many of us died. Our air choked, our crops diminished. No matter what sacrifice they would take their fill. Our people had only just recovered to pre-tithe levels when the darkness fell upon us. So none of us begrudged these paltry numbers, those who maintained the blessings. It could be hard to watch. Unlucky if the wind changed and you were assailed by the stench. But you can look away, for those unaccustomed to such things. It only happens in the cities the bigger gifts to the gods. Eventually, when you see the good that is being done by the blessings, you come to stop looking away, not feeling uncomfortable. You can view those who are honored. You can look in their eyes and say, for you, for you I will continue feeling joy and more. You have given all of us a life we could never have dreamed of before. Freedom, we could never have bought otherwise. Joys we could never have reached. It is a cost borne hard, but well, even so. The light from them can be blinding, the heat and sound overwhelming. I cannot admire them all, nor for too long at one time. We felt safe. We were living, not just existing, truly living creating a utopia. It was worth the cost. I would have been honored to be a blessing. Not my ideal outcome, but it was worth it. Because the night was no longer to be feared. The price had been met. And it stopped. The night our lover again, not our enemy. The four had burned away the dark ones, replaced them with their own takers of blessings. And we thrived. We knew that all worlds should one day know the warmth of the blessings. But no ships arrived for generations. We celebrated, for the many gods had chased away the one. When new stars arrived in the night sky, our hearts sank. They had come. But it did not go as they had thought. They were lost. They were army men. Soldiers. They landed in their vast numbers, gasping for fresh air, emaciated. They had been lost in the journey. We fed them. We kept them outside our cities by providing lavish tents, many of us serving. We fed them. We helped them. But when some of them snuck into our city, they were shocked. 
They prepared in the day. They moved in the night. The huge columns of soldiers. They should not have done this. The takers of blessings were sent by the many, and they resumed their old dark and terrible forms. They fell on the columns of the Astra Militarum, went into their tents where the two weak to mobilize were, appeared from shadows amongst the marching feet. Many were dragged under, many torn apart. Some were worn by the servants of the four. They signaled the surrender, and all who they commanded followed suit. They were ready, ready to believe in something better. And very soon, when they felt the warmth of the guards, they were more ardent than even we. We were going to use their vessels, use these men and women, and spread the warmth of the guards, the blessings for this venture. They would be vast, and, being selfish, I wanted to witness them, and not directly contribute, or participate, so to put it. But this was merely due to the wish to see the spectacle, to bask in the light and heat. We were so close. That is when it happened. That is when it came. The Holy War. It was different this time. Instead of a few score stars in the sky, this time it was during the day, and it was not a few dozen. It was hundreds of them. They blotted out the light of the sun. A flyby of swift-moving fighters gave them full visual confirmation of what their ship's sensors must have already told them. The servants of the one had returned, and they were not looking for surplus or surfeit, stores or caches. The orbital bombardment was pointed, as much as it can be from a fleet. Yet somehow we knew... Despite them glassing an entire island, leveling most of our capital cities, they were being restrained. The many put shields up around some cities, made people proof from their weapons in others. They tried. But the servants of the one began to arrive. They wanted this world. They would clean it. They were coming. I was attached to the main command, the liaison with the converted men who were once guardsmen of the tyrant. They called themselves veterans. They called themselves the best, the brightest, the brave. They burned with zeal. Yet the command was pandemonium as soon as contact filled their screens and scopes. They began to fire up, barked orders and activating turrets and nests. Burning lights and anger belched into the skies. Yet so few of the enemy conveyances spouted smoke, let alone fell from the skies. As they got closer, I stepped outside of the tent. Some ghastly urge brought me out to witness it. I could not help myself. It was the exact same urge as I felt when I witnessed the blessings. I could not look away. For this, I felt, was another blessing. Another cost. Like of old. But this time I was horrified, for this was to be done in the name of the One, and he knows nor shows any pity or mercy. Worse, he had sent his wives, his handmaidens. They were fury incarnate. I could see inside. I could see our lines struck, our units becoming non-responsive. It was all so fast, so fast. These were legendary guardsmen, the elite of the universe. Yet they were falling like children before the force of their attacker. They were here. I saw them first. I was looking into the skies. I somehow knew. My hand cupped over my eyes, giving me shade. They were in a perfect circle as they descended. Two, as they came out of the sky, the sun behind them. It was almost beautiful. Then the sound hit, the thrusters, the jump packs, and the men around me started to die, messily. The snap of their terrible pistols, then immediately followed by a soldier exploding nearby, 
limbs severed, heads popping. It was horrific. The men tried to muster, to regain cohesion. It was the commissar. The one with the red eyes, despite having no obvious implants. His voice seemed to boom around me, but never strike me directly. The men ranked and fired up. But order was smashed again when our first three volleys in quick succession rebounded. We burnt a few, but so few. Their armor gave contempt to our meager last fire unless the men concentrated them down. The handmaidens landed, their pistols blazing, but they did so in two circles, as I said. Large ones. There must have been a hundred of them if a one. Fifty fired outward, forming a perimeter, cutting into any units trying to support us. The inner circle fired into our massed ranks mercilessly. They were swift despite their armor, advancing unpredictably, yet so professionally as to angle their armor to its fullest. This is when I had to roll back into the tent. I could see out, but I was far from the edge. The boots of the commissar passed me on his way outside with many an officer in tow. But it was... It was horrific. These silver-clad armored warriors were all women, all handmaidens, all lethality given form by a spiteful and vengeful god, and they could not be stopped. The ones in the first wave had kept everyone pinned or pulverized, but now the butchery began in earnest. The Zephyrim arrived. These had bolt pistols in one hand, but the carnage came from their right. They had power swords there, Keen-edged and ancient blades with fields of energy around them. Able to cut armor and steel as though it were only bone and blood, they came down from above as well. But they landed right in the middle of knots of men and women and tore them apart. Balter eruptions, limbs flopping, decapitations rolling, blood everywhere. They were mad, for not once did they speak, none of them. Not when they burnt a man with hand flamers, his body crawling for a few moments by covering burning Prometheum. Not when they were struck or bled themselves. They could. We heard when they created a second push and redoubled their assault. So many died. Yet the Commissar held his own. More than that. He was best by the many. The four were guiding his blade, I'm sure of it. For he alone stood against the fanatics, cutting down everyone. He danced between them, striding until the last. Then a burst of energy from his blade, a swift step or ten. He cut them down with effort, not ease. But he went through more than four, before the next event dragged my eyes up the road towards its source. I felt rumbling, the sound of heavy treads on roads. Our reinforcements had been only seconds away. A column we were about to embark on. Lehman Rust tanks appeared, rolling up. But before them were our ogrins. The outer and inner lines of the first wave of warrior women now peeled back. They retreated before the approaching slab-shielded ogrin lines. All the while, the front tanks fired their battle cannons at the freeing seraphim. But it was then that I realized it was over. Utterly. I could not see how anything could stop them. For there were these handmaidens, these silvered sisters. They had huge war suits, twice the height of a man, it seemed. They were inside them. The Ogrin received shots, and the precision was such that hails of bottle fire was used to push their shields back or to the side. Then the war-suited women would finish them with heavy bottle fire. Yet even as the tanks attempted to take aim on them, Melter shot came from the superiors of each triad of these sisters, and the front tanks were disabled and heated and collapsed in upon themselves. At the head of this rampage was an especially ornate and impressive set of armor, with an equally impressive person within. The Ogren charge she met head on, and she created a carpet of dead as she moved through them. Her mighty spear going through shield, arm, and body behind, she fired missiles from her shoulders and more demon rust tanks in the second ranks burned or exploded. The ranks of suits slammed into the last of the Ogrin and finished them off, yet they lead a start. She looked around briefly, then snapped out orders. Forked assault pattern. 
Sisters to my right, flank hard. Sweep away the rabble along with the last units of traitors. Sisters to my left, likewise, but keep your eyes on those towers. Sisters to my four, push around the tank formation. Take them all. In the name of the God Emperor! I will deal with this last issue, then join you. There is more to this than meets the eye. And there he stood. The Commissar grinned at her as he stood in a circle of dead sisters. Each had their throats slit, their eye guards punctured, saying in precise ways that bypassed their power armor. Only one was taken piecemeal. The Commissar stood transfixed. His eyes glowed red, his power sword field a musky red in hue also. As he made no sign of moving, even though his opponent stood in full warsuit battle plate. Insanity. The High Lord, the sister of battle, so youthful in face, yet old as the mountains in spirit, lunged forward and struck. She unleashed a wave of Sanctorum missiles from her warsuit, Purgator Milibalis. They flew to their target and tore him apart, the hat of the Commissar floating down onto a wrecked shell. But this is when Val crunched her feet into the dirt, hardening her position. This was due to the spectral energies that now floated from the dead Commissar. Lambent energies that swirled and coalesced into the form of a huge demon. The High Lord sneered, spat and then charged. The being summoned a vorpal blade and parried the first of her strikes, its skill exceptional. The two were a whirlwind of blows. Each parried and countered with such speed and force that sparks cascaded from them like a waterfall. Finally, the demon struck down with a mighty overhead blow, the first opening it had made. Out of frustration, it seemed, incredulous that any mortal could match its skill. Of course, it was then, as its blade passed over her shoulder and into the ground, as more than Val sidestepped an angle to avoid, she then took her sacred spear, the Lance of Illumination, and performed a lunging strike directly into the demon's heart. The Emperor protects, and he avenges! The blade point pierced its flesh and sank in deep. Then a light burned from within the demon, crashing over its skin, and beams of white light shone out of its eyes. As the demon then turned to mist and dust specks, its power broken, it was undone and banished from this realm. The High Lord looked at its dissipation, and merely nodded. To anyone else, this would have been a feat never to be surpassed, a glory unbound. To the High Lord, it was just another battle, another victory in the name of the One, of her God, Emperor. Flagellants. The Inquisitor slowly marched into the Grand Hall, with only one being as his entourage. A bent-over and decrepit-seeming thing, covered in a huge, dirty, musty cloth wrap, its features utterly covered, and none could see exactly what it was. But by its staggered lurch, it was not something to be concerned about. Are we still friends? said the Inquisitor. The Inquisitor eyed the man in front of him. Dazzlingly attired, rings with rare gems mined hundreds of light years away, materials impossible to fabricate, exquisite to the touch, intimidatingly perfect in their stitching, the work of many hands over a very long time the ruler of this hive. He wanted for nothing, except, perhaps, humility. No, we are not friends, Barnabas. You come to my hive, you come to my world, and ask that for all of this. You demand and acquire so much it beggars belief. The Inquisitor slowly opened his mouth. I do not ask, 
I state. I am his servant, he who you proclaim to love, to worship. Why now do you refuse to comply? You know I carry the seal of the emperor. Why do you defy his will? I think not, retorted the governor. You claim to work on his behalf. Ah, but I suspect this has little to do with the will of the emperor. I think it is your will, your greed. You are not in a position to barter or bargain or refute or refuse. I am his servant. I am his will. And yet you stand alone in my halls. Well, apart from this, the sting at your side. Whereas all I need do is click my fingers. The governor then motioned to his men on either side of the grand hallway. Each moved in unison as they shouldered their las guns, pointing them at the Inquisitor. The Inquisitor raised his hands with open palms. The Lord smiled. A light then went off from his palms, bathing the governor from foot to head in a line of light, like a scanner, it seemed, but it was not. This is your last warning. Reconsider now. Heh. <laughs> light shows only work in feral worlds, boy. I'm not impressed with low-tech pantomime. Now, Neil, pay homage, and I may allow you to return to your ship and leave. Empty-handed, of course. And that's only a may. Now, Neil! Alas, said the Inquisitor, I cannot. The Inquisitor then stated boldly the one word, pacifism. And at that, the dirty ball of rags next to him exploded into activity. Throwing off the cloth draped over it, the being was not an ancient stooped-backed human. It was something else entirely. Its arms were no longer there, replaced by chains that flickered with electric power. And it moved faster than an Astartes as it charged towards the guards on one side of the hall. Lasguns ripped from the guards and hit the thing, but not many. It moved too fast. A stink of burnt flesh filled the air as two hit it seemingly dead on, but the thing did not even miss a pace. The guards on the other side of the hall fired at the Inquisitor, but found their ray slammed into an eggshell of power over the man. Screams were torn from throats as the thing hit. Its chains wrapped around guards and electrocuted them, burning the flesh from them. Others a bit kicked, tore apart, and when it had finished all of the men on one side, it screamed and charged around the hall to the other side. The entire event lasted less than two minutes, and at its end, the thing was panting yet moved back to the Inquisitor, who just looked at the governor placidly. Perhaps we should reconsider your previous statements. I trust you now see the truth of the matter. The governor slowly knelt and looked up at the Inquisitor. You are his will. You are his will. Good. I am glad you have seen the light. It started slow in my sister. We were always striving to be the best. For the Emperor's sake, for his glory, for his might. But something shifted. A little at a time, she started to change. We who fought together and worshipped him with such devotion. We did not want to believe it. My own sister. I thought she was trying to be more pure, more holy, more pious. But her faith was swaying. She was striving for perfection. 
staying in our camps between battles. We would pray together, and she said a longer prayer. No matter. She said she wanted to thank the Emperor's might that we prevailed in battle once more. We lit the candles and no one thought of it. We trained together and she would stay just a little longer. Swinging her sword over and over and over. She wanted to serve the Emperor to the very best of her ability. As she said... Later, she would sharpen her blade whilst we cleaned weapons, but she thought it wasn't sharp enough. There were still imperfections. My sisters and I didn't notice at first, for she remained our sister. She was vicious in battle and more attentive to her duties than ever before. The convent, when we returned, quickly became cleaner than it had ever ever been. The halls, the crypts, the murals of our saints. She had been cleaning them over and over and over. The armory was spotless, each bullet, gun, and sword in its place, lined up precisely. And my sister shone with pride, her faith to the Emperor called to her, pushing her to make us even greater. For him, of course. Only him. Everything was more organized. She was meticulous, and it was... perfect. One night, another one of my sisters, Agnesia, approached me, white as a sheet. Sweat covered her face as she whispered that her duties had been taken from her. Her sacred duty for which she had done for years had already been done. Someone had lit the candles. Every single one. That night we were ripped from our beds. In the pitch black they swept in and struck, snatching each one of my squad. Vasana struck one of her attackers and was thrown against the stone wall with a cry. Sabella had two holding her thrashing arms. She grunted with frustration as we heard the rattle of chains. Agnesia was restrained quickly and I heard her whispering prayers as she submitted. Doras hit the first intruder to try and confine her and sent them careening to the floor. But there were too many. They had the upper hand. Our struggling was for naught. Quickly, we were all dragged through the halls of our convent. Finally, the candlelight lit the faces of our captors. Our own sisters stood holding the chains between the five of us, disgust all over each of their faces. They held the chains tight but dared not to touch us. They acted as if looking upon us would be a crime in itself. We were treated like enemies, like traitors, and my sisters cried out to their comrades, Why? What have we done? Sisters, we are faithful. This is not the Emperor's will. We fight in his name. We act in his will. Silence, the abbess called out. It echoed off the walls and we all stopped. The rattle of chains and heavy breathing were the only sounds left. You have no right to speak of his will. You have no right to speak his name. You have no right to even think of him. You have disgraced us all. One among you has fallen, and I shall not let you drag us into the filth with you. The Inquisitor will be arriving shortly, and he will take great pleasure in finding the culprit. 
She signaled to the others and we marched in silence. A quiet animosity grew as we were escorted and every one of my squad was staring daggers into each other. We knew not what treachery had occurred, but we were all disgusted with ourselves for not seeing it. For trusting in sisters when one was a grotesque heretic. Each of us was filled with shame that we had failed. We had failed our faith and ourselves. We should have seen it. We were secluded from the rest of the convent, left in separate cells to wait for our fate, for the interrogation to begin. I looked to the other four and knew each one of us was quietly assessing the others. Vasana paced back and forth, huffing. A burning anger radiated from her. Agnesia sat in a corner of her cell. I could hear her whimpers bouncing off the walls. Sabella sat still and quiet, but watched. Doris was in the end cell. I could not see her, but I could hear a scratching noise. The trust between us shattered. We sat in silence for the rest of the night, each with our own guilt and shame, only accompanied by the scratching at the end of the hall. And I prayed. I prayed that the Emperor would show mercy to the innocent four of us. I prayed that I may remain untainted by the traitor's sin. The hollow ringing of bells ricocheted through the stone convent until we felt the vibrations and heard the faint sound in the cells below. The dawn had broken. None of us had slept, but the scratching finally stopped when we heard doors and footsteps down the hall. The tension suddenly became heavy with fear as the steps got closer and closer. We each knew it was him. The Inquisitor had arrived to pass judgment. The doors opened with a scrape of metal against stone and two people stepped into the dungeon. The Abbess from before and the Inquisitor. He walked with the Abbess in silence and as we watched him, he watched us. I felt like an animal as he inspected each of us, as if he could see our corruption on our skin like a mark. I held my head high. No one dared break the silence. He walked up and down the center. And he finally spoke, once he had assessed each of us in our cells. We know one of you has fallen and followed corruption to defile this holy place. I must not allow that weakness to contaminate and spread. We together will root out the perversion by any means necessary. And those among you that allowed the depravity to spread will be dealt with. A cell door was unlocked, the Inquisitor's entourage entered swiftly and Agnesia began to pray aloud. A crack sounded and I watched her fall against the stone, hard. Yet her voice continued, whispering out a plead to her Emperor. A soldier took their boot and with all their force stomped down onto Agnesia's arm. A sickening crunch told us all that her arm was completely snapped in two. You will not speak his name. Every word you utter now is an infernal sullying on the Emperor himself. None of you will speak holy words. You are heretics until proven otherwise. He declared to us all as Ignatius snivelled. 
grasping at her broken arm. He kept her in chains and took her just down the hall. There they stayed for hours. Ignicia was a strong sister, but she was the weakest out of all five of us. It was quiet to start. We were all left to wonder what was happening. What questions would the Inquisitor have? I knew she could not be fallen. She was weaker but more faithful than the abbess of this convent. Then, we heard a cry. Muffled by the doors, it was just a small sound. But it pierced through. High-pitched and short. It was gone the next moment. Then, it started up again. And it became more frequent. Agnesia was starting to crack. Whatever they were doing behind closed doors was starting to work. She tried to hold in her pain, to not let it show. She was trained well, but it was too much. And you could hear it, each shout growing louder. You could feel the frustration in her as she let her pain be known. Each scream involuntarily ripped from her body. She grew louder and louder, the high-pitched wails rung through my head as I imagined what torment she was suffering. The Inquisitor was known for taking pleasure in breaking down heretics, and it said he had a special set of tools to help. He liked to dabble in physical and mental pain, for it's easier to find the truth when all barriers are broken. And there's only so much physical torture can do. You can cut a body a thousand times, yet never reach the mind. Her screams became huskier with the strain on her throat. I couldn't help but picture a wounded creature. Each yowl felt like a knife to my own chest. I looked at my sisters. Vasana and I locked eyes, and I could see it in her too. Reflected back at me was the same expression. She felt the pain that I did. We felt Agnesia's pain, together. And then she looked down and turned away, and the connection was gone. We sat alone in our cells, listening to the cries of our sister until... They turned to weak sobs. She had nothing left when they opened the doors and dropped her body like a limp doll. She was a crumpled heap on the floor, sweat-stained and covered in blood. Her breathing was shallow, and she made her body as small as it could be, curling in on herself. A weak sob left her. And seeing my sister like that, her fragile form shaking, it broke my heart. She was a valiant warrior, and now she had been reduced to this. The guard kicked Agnesia one last time, muttering about heresy and filth. He locked her back in and walked up and down the hall, looking in each cell with a grin. He was enjoying this, enjoying our fear. When he stopped outside Sabella's cell, she dared not move. He opened the door and against her training, she shuddered away. He laughed as she backed away from him and he grabbed her. She forced her head down hard and planted it right into his skull, breaking his nose with a crunch. He cried out at the shock, and three more came, each grabbing onto Sabella. She fought as she was escorted down the hall to the Inquisitor. Sabella's screams were even louder than Agnesia's when she finally cracked. 
When Sabella's limp body was chucked back in her cell, for a moment, I could see the wounds on her skin. She was littered with slices, chunks pulled out, and even strips of flesh peeled right off. Different instruments could be seen in the pattern of her cuts, and she was covered in blood. Some of it hours old, brown, crusted, and some wounds oozed red blood over the top. Vesana was next. She took the longest by far. Took almost a day and a half before we heard her break. She started with small, broken cries. But eventually, the Inquisitor got his way. Her voice eventually became deafening, the hysterical wailing impossible to block out. I wept for my sisters, with nothing to do but imagine their torment. Doras was the last to go down the hall. A day passed and we heard no noise. No cries. No screams. Just... nothing. It was deep into the night when we heard the rattle of doors. Doras was in bad shape. Worse than the others when they returned. But with a smile on her face. The Inquisitor himself stepped in and stood before us as the guards pushed Doras to her cell floor. I have found the parasite that grew in your midst. Sister Doras has fallen to the Prince of Pleasure. She has disgraced us all, and you shall all burn. Her sins are your sins. For you should have seen and stopped the chaos that corrupted her. Turning a blind eye only seals your fate. You are all guilty. Only the purity of the fires can save you now. May the Emperor smite the evil in your souls. The Inquisitor couldn't help the smile on his face eager to carry out the execution order. You could see he hated to wait until morning. But judgment must be made a spectacle to teach the price of sin. The night went quickly, all too quickly. The silence filled with Doras scratching. During her time in the cell, working on just a few stones, she was scratching her nails down them, scratching until they were bloody, making the jagged, dirty surface of the age stone smooth and perfect. The rest of us could only wait, for we knew if this is how we are to best serve the Emperor, we shall accept our fate. But the anticipation grew. Vasana paced as the sun rose. Agnesia wept in her corner, and Sabella sat unmoving. I prayed. I prayed until the Inquisitor came and we were escorted through our convent. Our sisters were all gathered outside the convent, our home. Disgust and disdain were the only looks we faithful sisters got as we marched to the pyre in chains. When the time came and the Inquisitor read our crimes in execution sentence, we stood in silence. But the crowd became restless. They wanted to see us suffer and burn. They didn't care that we were once faithful that most of us stood before them were innocent. We were nothing but fallen scum now. The Inquisitor himself lit the flames and watched as they leapt up the kindling to the bodies of my sisters. 
They began to scream, and I felt the fires start to eat at my own flesh, and I'd never felt more alive. The holy flames burned my sins away, and I heard Doris's scream loudest of all. A strangled scream rung out, and she cried, Who betrayed me? I demand to know which of this fake sisterhood reported me to the Inquisitor. You coward! Face me before I die! I turned to her and laughed. I, Melas, called the Inquisitor, and I would see every sister here burn in the fire than fall. You are a dissenter and a disgrace. You are nothing, and I am holy. I am pure. The Emperor will bless me when I die. The shock in her eyes had me laughing. I took a deep breath. Sweat dripped down my face with the heat of the fire. The flames rose and climbed higher on my legs as the skin sizzled. The pain was unbearable. The air now thick with smoke and the reek of burning flesh. I breathed it all in as the deafening cries of my sisters came from both sides. I called over the crowd. Espiritu Dominus, Domin Libra Nos. From the lightning and the tempest, our emperor, deliver us. It took all my strength, but I screamed out, from plague, temptation, and war, our emperor, deliver us. Agnesia, Vesana, Sabella took a hold of their strength and joined with me. From the scourge of the kraken, our emperor, deliver us. From the blasphemy of the fallen, our Emperor, deliver us. From the begetting of demons, our Emperor, deliver us. Sisters in the crowd watching began to join us, their voices ringing out. From the curse of the mutant, our Emperor, deliver us. Amorte perpetua, domine libra nos. The voices in the crowd grew until a hundred of us were reciting together. That thou wouldst bring them only death. That thou shouldst spare none. That thou shouldst pardon none. We beseech thee, destroy them. And we said the prayer over and over and over as Doris screamed and howled all until the flames became too much and swallowed us into darkness.